He teaches us things we didn't know. The effects of uranium and strontium-90. Um, can you describe what actually it does? You say it binds to DNA. Yes. Um, one, of the, one of the main problems with the way in which radiation is assessed by the current uh, system of assessment, which is used to regulate nuclear power stations and, 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 and explain or predict the, the health effects, um, is that it's a particularly physical way of understanding radiation. It just dilutes energy into the body. But of course, in reality, inside the body, these substances uh, are chemicals. These, these radioactive substances are chemicals, just like any other chemical. Chemicals that we have evolved. Well, like iron or something. Like iron or hydrogen or, ca or calcium or... or so they're sand. elements. They're elements, that's yeah. right. But they're just elements which are... Uh, uh, unstable and suddenly decay and turn into something else and produce a, a, an alpha particle or a beta particle, which are like very highly energetic, um, if you, you can think of them as bullets, and they fly through the, the tissue producing lots of uh, little, little hot sparks called ions, and these hot sparks react with material in the body. Now the problem is that some of these elements are, are just the same group or very similar to elements which are used inside our body and which we've evolved with, but, but they never existed prior to 1945 when the first fissioning of uranium took place. Well, they existed as, what, yellow cake uranium or something? Well, yes, it's the same stuff. You, so natural comes, minerals, it's, it's, but they were in a hole in the ground somewhere. It's a natural mineral, but the point is that when you, fiss when you have fission, when you, t when you extract the, the radioactive, uh, the, 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 the U-235, the, the fissionable component of it, which was done around about 1945. In a centrifuge. Yeah, in a centrifuge. Then this material, if you make it into a critical mass, you, it will actually explode and it breaks down to these, all, all these, these, these new substances like strontium-90 mm -hmm. and cesium-137 and all these unstable elements, which, which, bind, which, which go into the body. They can be inhaled or ingested or eaten or whatever, or drunk. Um, and once they're inside the body, some of them bind to DNA because they have the same affinity for DNA that calcium has for DNA because calcium is normally what stabilizes the backbone of DNA. Mm -hmm. So if you take strontium, it's the same chemical group as calcium. And uranium also has a similar um, characteristic that it binds to DNA. The problem is that, that these substances are, are dangerously unstable. And having bound to DNA, they decay and give off these radioactive particles right into that particular part of the body where they're most affected. This is the genetic material. And they affect the chromosomes? Of course, they damage the chromosomes. And in fact, we know from studies that have been made of Gulf War veterans, for example, uh, and, and uh, the liquidators at, at Chernobyl, and also um, workers in, in uranium uh, mining facilities, that they have chromosome damage. So you can actually take the chromosomes, you can culture the chromosomes from their blood, in laboratories, and then you just look through a microscope and you can see some very strange chromosomes. Normally a chromosome is like an X. If you see mm -hmm. pictures of them in metaphase, you'll see that the chromosomes are like an X. The long ones and short ones and little ones, like the Y chromosome that make you a man. Uh -huh. But they're all like Xs. Um, and they have a central point of the X, which is called the centromere. But if you shoot, if you imagine that you shoot an alpha particle through them, you can sort of cut them, cut them, and then they can recombine in funny ways. And, they, and one of the ways they can recombine is to form what's called a dicentric. So instead of being an X, it's like an X with a circle and then another X all attached together, see? And uh, this sort of chromosome is associated with cancer and with genetic damage and all the rest of it. And they are caused by exposure to these internal radionuclides. That, okay. That's the problem. Well, let's look, at, let's look at depleted uranium because depleted uranium has been used as, as a warhead, if you like, in, in uh, munitions. Correct. Quite a while, quite a few years now. Yes. And the advantages for munitions manufacturers is that, one, it gets rid of radioactive waste, which otherwise has to be stored yeah. at great cost over a long period of time. And two... 4.9 uh, million years. 4.9 million years. Well, that's the half-life. No, sorry, billion years. 4.9 4 billion years. Yeah. Okay, so that's quite a long time, yeah. isn't it? So the other advantage, of course, for man manufacturers of weapons is that because it's so dense... It pierces armour and Correct. houses yeah, and yeah. whatever else you want to pierce. Well, well armour is what you mainly want to pierce. And the reason it does that is, is not only because it's dense, but also because it burns in air. So when it hits something, uh, the energy involved causes it to, to, to burn. And it self-sharpens. It, it burns at an enormously high temperature, thousands of degrees, and just burns its way straight through the tank. I mean, I, I've been to Iraq and I've seen these tanks where, they, where they, they've been... That's the one from the first Gulf War, is yes, it? The yes, ones that were leaving Kuwait? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they, um, 
It was a magical weapon. They won the war with it. I mean, armor, uh, there's, there's no point in having a tank anymore. You just come in with an A-10 and one of those Gatling guns and you fire these bullets. And it's only the size of my finger, one of these things. And it pops a hole straight through the tank. They have, ta they have sh tank shells as well. So this was the first sort of depleted uranium weapon, which was basically just what's called a penetrator. It's like a long rod, and they, and they just fire the rod, and the rod goes straight and then burns, and there's a great bang because of all the, 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 the burning. And the temperature, presumably. Of course, very high temperature, thousands of degrees, and it produces these very fine particles called nanoparticles, which are so small that they can go through the skin. They can go through any filter that you ever, that you ever imagine. So even though they're incredibly dense and therefore heavy, well, when you get because they're so that, small. Yeah, when you get down to that size, the concept of heavy is meaningless. You know, because because when when you're down to nanometer sizes, this is this is like ten to the minus nine of a meter. So they're they're very small. they they become an aerosol. Yeah, they are. They're like a gas, and they get buffeted by the air molecules, so they get kept up in the air, and they travel huge distances. We measured after the second Gulf War. My colleague Sisha Morgan and I we measured them in the filters at Aldermaston in in, in Berkshire. So it came all the way from Iraq all the way to the United Kingdom. And we, we looked at all the air patterns as well to show that it was possible that that was the case. But over the period of the Second Gulf War, there was a huge increase in, these con in the concentration of uranium at the atomic weapons establishment in Aldermaster. So the fact that the uh, Americans, the British and so on, and the other allies in the Gulf War are using these weapons, isn't it? it's not just about, even, no matter what you think about the people of Iraq or whatever they thought about the people of Iraq and what... Uh, the sanctity of their lives was, um, they're destroying potentially human beings that's all over the planet. That's absolutely true. A very interesting indicators of that is the sperm count in Israeli men, which was measured in, in uh, I think, 2007 it was, and they showed that the, constant, that the sperm count in Israeli men in Jerusalem had fallen catastrophically since, since the first use of, de of, of depleted uranium weapons, because it goes all over the Middle East. And they said that if, they, if these, these rates fell at a similar rate, by, by the year 2020, there would be no more Israelis. They would, they would be totally infertile. That would be it. Wow, that's very and, and I think this is happening all over the planet, which is why my message is very, very um, anguished, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, because all of this, this creation of this material, not, not just the uranium, but from Fukushima and so on, it's the sort of the human genome. What about, what about Fallujah, this Iraq, yeah. that the Americans wanted to deal with? Now, you told me, and um, I've read elsewhere, that there is evidence that what was used in Fallujah was not just depleted, so-called depleted uranium. No. But live uranium. Well, live uranium, it, it was slightly enriched uranium is what we found. We did three studies there. The third one hasn't been published yet, but the first two uh, are sufficient to, to define what happened. There were, after the, after the, the um, um, United States-led forces uh, engaged in the Battle of Fallujah, which was 2004, mm -hmm. there, there, there began um, an increase in cancer, an enormous increase in cancer, levels that were higher even than after the Hiroshima bombing of, uh, of Japan. Okay? Mm -hmm. We had a 38-fold excess of leukemia in that population, unheard of uh, levels of, of cancer. And at the same time, we had a, a change in the sex ratio, the number of boys to the number of girls, and we also had um, uh, infant mortality increases and congenital malformation increases. Well, I, I use semi some photographs, which we could be showing tonight, but probably not. Trust me, uh, you don't want to see them. And, and I know Brian Hall that I interviewed, who, as you know, camped out in Parliament Square until his untimely death last year. Um, he had photographs of some of those deformed babies in Parliament Square, and it was shocking. It is shocking. And this is happening not just occasionally, but a lot, isn't these places? Oh, it's, where it's ongoing. It's ongoing. Anyway, the point is that we, there, we, in order to find out what the cause was, we took hair samples from the parents of the children with congenital malformations. And, and, and to get back to your point, what we found, to our astonishment, was enriched uranium, not depleted uranium. And it has a different signature. It, it has a different signature, yeah. You can actually measure the isotopic ratio by measure, counting the atoms, and that's what we did as an instrument called a mass spectrometer which enables you to count the atoms of 235 and compare them to the atoms of 238. And you've got your own mass spectrometer? No, no, I've got a gamma spectrometer. The oh, mass okay. spectrometer is a great, huge, enormous lump, very expensive thing. I would, I would quite like to have one if anybody out there wants to buy me one, I have to say. But, uh, but they cost rather a lot of money. Okay, so well, we use one in Germany. So, okay, but you, you tested your samples from Fallujah. Absolutely. And yeah, you found... Yeah, we 
found, we found enriched uranium. Enriched. And, we also, and we also, incidentally, were, which I thought was rather clever, I have to say, looked along the hair of the women who had long hair. And so, as you know, hair grows at a certain rate, one centimetre a month it is, in fact. So by, by looking at the end of the hair of a woman who had very long hair, we were able to go right back to 2005. And, and what, what we found was that the uranium in the hair was going up as you went back. So that means it was from the Fallujah battle, this uranium. In 2004? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, knowingly, the Americans, because this was an American assault, yes. were using live uranium. They Surely used... this should be the headline in tomorrow's newspapers. I, I, we tried to get it into all the newspapers. In the end, the only people that, that and quite fortuitously, I was phoned up by Russia today who wanted, a, wanted me to interview them about something completely different. <coughs> and I said, look, you know, we've got this story. And, they, and so they said, okay. So I, I put it out on Russia today, but none of the British newspapers, it was sent to, uh, to, to two major newspapers. They wouldn't touch it. Which they, two? They, Let's name them. Okay. Uh, well, um, it went to the Independent, uh, and it went to Robert Fisk, who said he was going to do the story. Uh -huh. uh, and then nothing happened, nothing happened. And then, then after, after about a month of it not happening, and I talked to also Patrick Coburn, who'd done another story in The Independent for, about the same story, mm -hmm. uh, the earlier one, you know, the, the, the actual epidemiological study we did. Yeah. They, they covered that. We had front pages and everything. Mm -hmm. And then I gave it to Jonathan Leake, uh, who's also a kind of guy who's, who's, who's done the stories for me before in the Sunday Times. And that disappeared as well. So I'm pretty sure that there's some kind of enormous uh, pressure on the British newspapers, the major newspapers, to keep this kind of thing up. Because you would think, as you said, this is like kind of a major story. Dump, yes, using live uranium on a civilian population, no matter how many, you know, so-called rebels or Al-Qaeda or mm. whatever you want to call them, are amongst that population. Well, the interesting question is, what is the weapon? That really is what we need to know. Because, because nobody would... I mean, you don't want to use enriched uranium against people because it's like shooting your enemy with diamonds. It's very expensive stuff. So you would want to know quite what the weapon was that they were using. Or well, perhaps it was nearly depleted uranium. Well, that's one possibility, that they were just covering their tracks. I, I think that is a reasonable explanation because uh, after the first Gulf War, there was an awful lot of aggro about depleted uranium and then an awful lot of NGOs who were trying to ban depleted uranium weapons and they're kind of succeeding. And I rather feel... Well, they're still being used. They were used in Libya, weren't they? I, well, nobody really knows. We haven't got any... I mean, I, I'm going to get some samples and try and check it out. But, uh, but I wouldn't be keen on... I wouldn't be looking for depleted uranium anymore because I think they've been not using that since 2003 and probably to cover their, back, cover their tracks. But uh, didn't I also read that they're using it in small arms fire now, small arms ammunition? Yes, yeah, that's what we think so. They're, they're patterns. We've, we've discovered patterns where they put uranium in the warheads of... of, of, of um, of, of ground, 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 ground to ground weapons, yeah, sure. Um, and also we found, yeah, no, this is the other thing, we, we, uh, we've also found it in the Lebanon, so the Israelis are using it also. We find enriched uranium in the Lebanon. And that's for sure, absolutely for sure, because we got a bomb crater and we took stuff out of the bomb crater and we measured it in two different laboratories using two different techniques. So the Israelis are using, you're saying that the Israelis are using live uranium against the, Leban the Lebanon? They did, that's right, yeah. When was that? 2006. That was when they had that back yeah, they lost. Yeah, the, the incursion into, into, in the, into the Hezbollah, um, at the big attacks there, which they had, to, they had to back off in the end, didn't they? Remember? Yeah, I do remember. Yeah. Well, again, that should be headline news, shouldn't it? Well, it was, actually. Uh, Robert Fisk did put it on the front page of the Independent. Well, that it was live uranium? That it, that it was enriched uranium, yeah. Really? I'm sorry, I never saw that. Uh, and so that was why I sent, that's why I sent this news story to, to, to him. You know? And he said, oh, yeah, well, and he was going to go out to Fallujah and do it and everything, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. So I think there's some big dogs out there at the moment, you know, who are tr stop, stopping any of this stuff coming out. And I, I see this as a sort of parallel... Uh, pressure that's coming forward at the same time as, as, as the nuclear, the so-called nuclear renaissance. You know, it's all part of the same thing, really, I think. Well, you mean this push to have new power stations? Yes, new that's right. Stations. Yeah, you see, because the point <laughs> is, the point is this, that, no, sorry to interrupt, but this is no, the no, thing, sure. you know, that if uranium is causing these effects at the low doses, you know, conventionally expressed, then it has all sorts of ramifications for other aspects of using radiation. Because what might have previously seemed to be relatively safe, suddenly becomes of course, of course. very unsafe. That's right. 
And, and we know that all this stuff comes out of nuclear power stations all the time. And they're perpetually telling us that, you know, there's no problem in nuclear power. They're absolutely safe, nobody dying, blah, blah, blah. We're going to talk about that when we come back from the next break. I want to learn more.